Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, we will be launching a, a new report uh, for the IEA uh, State of Energy Policy 2024 uh, today. So thank you very much for joining. Um, we'll have about 20 minutes uh, going through the key findings of the report, and then we will turn to Q&A um, with everyone here today. So uh, maybe a bit of background on the origin of this report. So this builds on a process the IEA does every year, which is looking at the, the policies and the policy changes that are going on in the world of energy globally. And this informs many parts of our work, um, but also in particular the world energy outlook and the updates we see each year as we project the impacts of these policies and other trends uh, on the uh, evolution of energy use in the world. Um, this process, what we were seeing as we were looking at this is that in the last five years, we've seen a, a strong uptick in the types um, and the varieties of policies that are being passed and an increasing frequency in which many of these key policy types were being used. Um, for example, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of the economic recovery packages included provisions for clean energy and other aspects of, of energy affordability uh, and energy security. Um, and this was a one of the largest upticks we've seen in the total amount of uh, spending allocated for investment support for energy globally. Of course, that was then followed immediately by uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and uh, an energy security uh, crisis um, that prompted a lot of governments to look at all aspects of energy security, how this impacted consumer affordability, as well as also looking into the future and saying, what do we need to do to secure future energy supply chains, including those for critical minerals um, and clean technologies like solar batteries and EVs. Uh, so what we saw on all of this was uh, a few types of policies um, crystallizing as key interventions that many countries were using. And we wanted to make sure that we were structuring this database in a way that was usable, um, that people would be able to see all the different policy making that is going on in the globe and be able to use it to inform their decision making and their research. So um, at its core, the new state of energy policies is not just a report, but also a very comprehensive policy database and a big reboot of a former database, the IEA RAM, the Policies and Measures Database, and builds on that, covering over 50 countries and looks at what is the latest policy on the books for those uh, different countries. It covers over 120 different types of policy instruments across all the key energy sectors. Um, and what we've logged is 5,000 different policies that are currently active on the books in different countries. Um, and this is available in our new energy policy inventory, um, which is a much more user-friendly interface um, to be able to explore these policies and covers a stock take of government spending, regulations, and trade policies. Um, so we will take you through the key findings that we had that really focus and try to highlight on what were the major changes in energy policy in the last year and how are we seeing this build on trends uh, that have been evolving, particularly since 2020, where we saw this large increase in uh, government support for energy and energy transition. So um, I'm joined today by two colleagues, uh, Gabriel Sev and Echo Chua, um, who are, are the lead authors and key contributors to this report, um, and they'll take you through the key findings. So first, I'll hand it over to Echo. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. One of the key findings as part of this report is the unprecedented rise in government spending aimed at accelerating the transition towards clean energy technologies in the recent years. So what you see here is the government spending spread across the time horizon. This builds on the initial G20 mandate given to the IEA back in 2021 to track government spending in clean energy technologies as part of the recovery plans. This eventually got expanded to what you see here as part of today's release. Every budget liner that we track has been made available on the IEA website. If I may, I wish to also stress that this analysis builds upon the committed amount by the government, but is in no way the actual disbursement. Since 2020, governments worldwide earmark nearly $2 trillion for clean energy. Looking at 2024 alone, already more than 40 countries have earmarked a total of $290 billion. Major initiatives like the United States Inflation Reduction Act came in as the largest at $370 billion. While this marked a peak in government spending, disbursement from other packages between 2020 and 2023 are still ongoing. As we move on to the mid to late 2020s, we see uh, the pace of spending starts to decline as some of the largest packages like the EU Recovery and Resilience Facility finish its disbursement by 2027. 
However, as you would have noticed, the bars from 2024 onwards are being grayed out. And this is because these figures are only the indicative forward-looking spending. We do expect more money to be, uh, more spending to be earmarked as governments continue to put in fresh funds. Since 2020, low emissions electricity has received the most global support at $480 billion. This is followed by energy efficient buildings, mass transit, as well as low emission vehicles. This together account for more than two thirds of the total spending. Much of this spending extends well into the late 2030s, signaling the government's long-term support towards clean energy growth. At the same time, Governments around the world are increasingly focusing on se securing their clean energy supply chains. The global clean energy supply chain remains highly concentrated, with more than 80% of the manufacturing capacity in solar PV, wind, batteries, and hydrogen production clustered within just three countries. This concentration creates vulnerabilities, making these supply chains susceptible to disruptions from policy shifts, natural disasters, and any other external factors. In order to mitigate this risk, what we notice is that countries are now deploying targeted incentives to boost domestic manufacturing capabilities across the critical clean energy technologies. Since 2020, approximately $170 billion has been allocated globally to support domestic production. And this accounts for around 10% of the total government spending in the same time period. Low emissions passenger vehicles, hydrogen batteries came in as the fastest growing areas as government continue to provide do direct domestic manufacturing incentives to develop local capabilities in these targeted areas where most of the capacity is still growing and diversifying. The largest recipient has been the low emissions passenger vehicles with around $50 billion allocated since 2020, supported by new programs in several countries, notably in the United States, China, India, as well as Brazil. We were also surprised to see how low emissions hydrogen is receiving a substantial sum and increase in government support. This has totaled to $36 billion since 2020. This actually shows how government are viewing hydrogen as a key component of low carbon future, such as in Australia, Canada, as well as Germany. Finally, Batteries have received about $21 billion in support over the past four years. The focus on battery manufacturing is particularly strong in countries like the United States, India, as well as Japan. In addition, in addition to direct financial incentives, government are also using a range of other policy tools to support domestic clean energy manufacturing. And this is also where trade policy come into play. Since 2020, we have witnessed a sharp rise in trade policies targeting clean energy supply chains. Over the last 25 years, the number of trade policies have been increasing steadily. However, since 2020, the number of new policies surged, with nearly 200 new policies being implemented as compared to fewer than just 40 in the preceding five years. This analysis excludes free trade agreement, which I will touch on later on. Trade actions such as tariff adjustments, anti-dumping duties, as well as countervailing measures now account for nearly 40% of the new trade measures implemented since 2020. Many of these recent trade policies target specific sectors, such as those you see on the right of the chart. The geopolitical aspects of these trade policies is significant. For instance, for some of the trade measures that target the Chinese made goods, they also extend to other regions, including the Southeast Asia, the Middle East, as well as other emerging markets. And the intent of this is to reduce the potential of trade circumvention, which includes sidestepping as well as bypassing of trade measures. At the same time, we also see countries in Asia Pacific, as well as Argentina and Egypt, reducing tariffs on certain clean energy technologies. It is not just tariff, definitely. It's also the non-tariff measures that are also playing a critical role in shaping the clean energy trade. For example, the European Union Foreign Direct Investment Screening Regulation ensures that the clean technologies are are secure and meet the security standards within EU, while China, as well as emerging, other emerging markets, are offering tax reductions and exemption to encourage foreign investors. During the same time period, free trade agreement, FTAs in short, have continued to facilitate the global exchange of clean energy goods. While there have been some exclusion in certain clean energy technologies, such as low emissions vehicles, solar PVs, and wind turbines, they still continue to be included by and large, with only less than 10% of the exclusions being noticed. 
Motivation to secure energy supply chain and navigate geopolitical uncertainty and facilitate trade flows are some of the key drivers behind the rise in trade measures. Undisputedly, these metric measures would have a significant impact on the cost of energy transition. And this is further analyzed as part of the upcoming Energy Technology Perspective Report by the IEA set to be released later this month. And with that, I'd like to pass the time over to my colleague, Gabriel Sef, who will be sharing with you more on the regulatory insights of this report. Thank you, Iko. Regulation are the final component analyzed in the State of Energy Policy Report, uh, complementing the picture of government tools to both mitigate emissions and ensure energy security. And regulation, like government spending, see advances in both coverage and stringency with uh, MAPS, so minimum energy performance standards, emission standards, uh, mandatory codes installation bound now covering close to three quarter of uh, uh, global energy rate emission. And this is a substantial change from just a few decades ago. I will only take one striking example. On 20 years ago, only 5% of industrial motors were covered by uh, energy performance regulation, and now it's over 50%. And this is only one among many other examples that we have in uh, uh, increased uh, coverage. Specifically over the past 12 months, 35 countries representing around one fifth of uh, uh, energy sector CO2 emissions passed new regulation. You can see uh, uh, the example for D20 on the, on the right hand side. Um, major first Ryan mentioned the Australia first ever fuel efficiency standards. Uh, the EU regulation on hydrofluorocarbons and Ukraine's first uh, biofuel blending mandates set to start in 2025. That being said, increasing the coverage of these standards is essential but becomes limited, and substantial leeway exists to both uh, advance stringency and enforcement of these policies. And we actually can spot over the past 12 months notable impactful updates that go into the direction of more stringent and more ambitious uh, rules in all sector. And that includes, among others, uh, the new greenhouse gas uh, uh, emission standards for passenger cars and trucks, as well as the new regulation for emissions from fossil fuel fired power plants in the United States. I will conclude by highlighting one trend. Notable World Bank's all delays were applied to a number of regulations on the banning of installation of uh, new fossil fuel boilers, the sale of IC vehicles, and the use of unabated coal in the power sector. Such adjustments were largely motivated by the new crisis and public concern, and the replacement regulation either delayed the start date uh, for compliance or relaxed the proposed policy stringency. It's yet important to underline that their impact was smaller than the increased stringency as well. Regulation uh, that were rolled back or delayed in 2023 uh, covered around 1% of current global emission, and that needs to be compared with the one fifth mentioned previously. If we're taking a bit of perspective and a, a step back, this surge in policy implementation matches with the increase in uh, climate ambition set in past four years. The coverage in emissions of net zero targets uh, plateaued in 2020 and 2021, so before and uh, around COP26. And uh, along with most nationally determined contributions, the, ND the NDCs updated in the same time period. Only few new updates or announcements occurred in the past 12 months, leaving current indices implied in energy sector emissions, stabilizing around 32 gigaton of CO2 equivalent, uh, implying actually a peak in emission this decade. With the Paris Agreement ratchet mechanism, so it's the incentive to submit uh, updated indices every five years, um, the next round of NDC submission shall happen early next year with enhanced mitigation targets towards 2035. And like we're doing for policy implementation, the AA will continue its tracking of these pledges with close to real-time updates of its uh, Climate Pledges Explorer um, released last year and updated with new metrics in September 2024. Um, with, uh, with it, we aim to show the implication of each of these pledges on the energy sector, and most importantly, the evolution of these pledges uh, over time. Uh, and what's important here is also that uh, um, this, uh, this, um, this uh, climate pledges explorer will notably inform the lead up to COP30 in Brazil. The IA also recently released at the last UN General Assembly guidelines from uh, taking stock to taking actions uh, with recommendation on how to achieve COP28 outcomes uh, for the energy sector. 
and uh, the implication of partial implementation of those goals. So for both of these products, we, we cannot dive into it for, for this presentation, but I will, uh, of course, recommend you to have a close look to, uh, to those products. The objective we had while releasing the state of energy policy reports was not only to provide a comprehensive uh, annual publication that gives an overview and snapshots of energy policies globally, but um, also to leave publicly available all the collection work and review work we led. And this is a critical element, as I see most people attending this workshop knows, uh, collecting and maintaining policy databases can be a long and repetitive process. We hope that providing the access to all in the most user-friendly manner uh, will lead to more efficiency, synergies, and provide support for um, uh, further research in this area of work. And for that, the energy policy inventory uh, comprises more than 5,000 um, enforced policies of our government incentive, regulation, and trade policy for all sector and more than 50 countries. It bases on the large effort of um, um, policy monitoring to feed into our model and reports, along with a regular review of IEA members' uh, countries' representative. Um, it aims to be dynamic and regularly updated uh, to be as close as feasible to the current state of energy policies uh, around the globe. Every single policy can be checked and reviewed with uh, official sources and summary and can be clicked in, again, a very uh, user-friendly environment. And as per all new data products, uh, we would, of course, welcome uh, any feedback, uh, insights, notes to improve this inventory. And you can contact us on the uh, policy address, uh, the uh, policies at IA.org. We just reached the uh, end of this presentation of the key findings uh, and the energy policy inventory. We will uh, now open to uh, questions. I see some that are already in the Q&A. Uh, so feel free to um, ask your question using the tool uh, or in the chat, and we will uh, answer them promptly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriel and Echo. Um, and just to say that this data set, um, we were very fortunate um, to have the comprehensive review by all of the countries that we, uh, all of our member countries, as well as also other countries that are part of the IEA family, um, were involved in the review process to make sure we had all of the right policies um, and the most updated information on those. So this is really a, a truly vetted um, and robust uh, data set here. Um, we hope to continue to expand uh, some of the, the coverage of that um, in terms of the different types of policy instruments that we cover. Obviously, in a first year, we had to con contain our excitement and restrain that to only a few subsets of those, but hoping to expand that uh, coverage and database in the future as well. So um, we have several different types of questions that are coming in right now. Um, please continue to put those in the Q&A function. Um, but we'll start taking through these. So the first question, uh, uh, what types of government spending are most effective for promoting clean energy technologies? Uh, Gabrielle, do you want to take this one? Thanks for the question. Um, let me take a step at it. So while the state of energy policy and the subsequent energy spending analysis do not provide an evaluation on the effectiveness of the policy passed by the governments, um, it does actually present an overview of the policy actions and the evaluation. So analysis on the policy effectiveness are actually part of the broader work set at the OECD through the inclusion inclusive forum on the carbon mitigation approaches. So I will actually encourage you to also refer and stay tuned to that. That being said, the effectiveness of government spending in promoting clean energy technologies often hinges on the type and focus of the spending. Investments in research and development are critical, and they lead to breakthroughs in clean energy technologies, making them more competitive in the market. Additionally, direct financial incentives such as subsidies and tax credits for clean energy projects have also proven effective in stimulating the investment. Infrastructure investments are also vital for promoting clean energy tech and government spending on upgrading the grid, developing EV charging networks and improving public transportation can also create the necessary framework for a sustainable energy future. And with that, I hope I answer your question. Perfect. Thank you so much, Echo. Um, next, we have one uh, coming in saying, 
Uh, many thanks for the great presentation. Can I ask what are the energy performance performance regulations? Um, which changes have been done? Uh, what are the focus countries? Many thanks in advance. Uh, Gabrielle, do you want to take this one? Sure. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so regarding the energy performance regulations, um, what I um, try to emphasize already in the presentation is that we are covering a large already set of, uh, of, of policy types that goes from the minimum energy performance standards for some appliances so or the air conditioners, heat pumps, etc. Um, we also have the emission standards that uh, um, that are good for uh, passenger cars, trucks, um, uh, and uh, and also uh, the emission standard that are for uh, fossil fuel uh, power plants. Uh, we uh, have uh, anything that looks like uh, mandatory codes, so the energy. Uh, the energy codes for for buildings are are part of our analysis, and um, and um, and I think that's uh, um, mostly mostly it. Um, you can find actually in the uh, in the state of energy policy reports uh, sectoral sections uh, that has actually snapshot and uh, actual clear uh, visualization on the the policy coverage that, uh, that we have, and especially for for the regulation side. And uh, you can also uh, see in these snapshots the um, the evolution uh, by country uh, of these uh, of these uh, performance regulations. So I would uh, highly incentivize you to to have a look to uh, to all sections. Uh, I, I didn't mention here, but we also have uh, a section on power, building, industry, um, uh, fuels, and uh, feels like I'm forgetting one. No. Yes. Feels where we're good. Um, and this is uh, covering uh, in the report uh, D20 uh, mainly, so for uh, for the information. But uh, in the uh, energy policy inventory, we uh, cover uh, more than 50 countries. So again, D20 countries plus IE member countries, uh, and uh, and the um, all EU countries uh, that are there. Uh, I hope that yes uh, answer your question. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. We have another one up here, um, which is a, a bit more uh, of a qualitative one. What types of government spending are most effective for promoting clean energy technologies? Um, and so this one right here, uh, maybe I'll take a stab at this and then I'm going to read a few off right now um, and we'll go through them in sequence. Um, how do domestic manufacturing incentives impact job creation? Um, and then I'm like, oh, you happy to take that one? Perfect. And then Sorry, and then we have one that's a uh, three-parter. Um, one, uh, could protectionist trade policies harm global clean energy progress? I'm happy to take that one as well. Um, and then how does the report uh, address the issue of energy affordability, um, particularly in the context of government interventions in the energy market? So um, I'll we'll tick through those ones. So I'll start with the, the first one and I'll hand it over to Echo for the DMI. Um, so what we found is that you know each government uh, spending measure, uh, they're suited for the market that they're in, and there's not a sort of a one size fits all uh, answer in these contexts. But what we've seen is a, a strong trend for two themes, I think. One is simplicity. What is the most direct, evident, and clear uh, support mechanism that investors can understand readily and be able to factor in um, with a, a good deg degree of clarity uh, what this is going to mean for their bottom line. Um, and this has been proven to be quite effective to attracting those investors to these markets um, as well. So I think that's one thing that we're seeing is a uh, push towards more simplicity um, away from some other sort of more mechanized, marketized mechanisms to deliver some of these incentives. The other big trend is making sure that these are available over a long time period. Um, so what we saw was uh, that I think over 60% of the different uh, incentives that we tracked in there are available out to 20, near to 2030. Um, and so this is a, a big thing that investors have called for. And I think governments are answering is how do we make sure that these incentives are available for a longer time and that allows for project development cycle to be, uh, you know, be able to have uh, not be rushed and sort of finding where that sunset period is. Oftentimes people would say, oh, we're gonna extend this for one or two years. And you would see a big push uh, for getting some projects off the, across the finish line or really having a longer term certainty of their availability was key to make sure that the industry wasn't sort of in this boom and bust rush cycle on that. So I think these are two themes, but again, uh, each mechanism uh, is really tailored for the, the unique situations in different countries. 
Um, I'll hand it over to, to Echo for the DMI question. So the DMI one on how DMI can actually impact job creation. Um, on this question, uh, I think DMI can have a significant and rather direct impact on, uh, on job creation. And it's not just job creation, but also on job quality as well in the clean energy sector. So through financial support, uh, what we believe is that local manufacturers can therefore be encouraged to expand through investing in new facilities, hiring more workers, and also paying better wages. So as manufacturers grow and more, uh, hire more workers, they can also create more demand for goods and services in their communities and also further up the supply chains. This can therefore create multiplier effects for other market players across the value chain, amplifying the economic impact of clean, en clean energy manufacturing. Moreover, uh, domestic manufacturing jobs in the clean energy sector often also provide competitive wages and benefits. So let me take the US landmark 2022 Inflation Reduction Act as an example. So it contains provisions requiring the manufacturers to pay prevailing wages, and in many cases, it to hire apprentices in order for them to qualify for the incentives even. So this can not only support the pipeline for the skilled energy workers, but it can also have a positive impact on wages as well as job quality across the entire sector. And also in the case of US, what we have noticed is that hundreds of thousands of clean energy jobs have been added over the past few years following the implement implementation of not just the IRA, but also other domestic manufacturing incentives, including the CHIPS Act, as well as the Infrastructure Investments and Job Act. And with that, which is of course the most exciting, um, I think this will be a perfect lead up to the uh, World Energy Employment Report that will be released by IEA coming this November. So the report itself will contain the most up-to-date employment data and insights in not just US, but also definitely many other countries and regions. And I highly encourage everyone to stay tuned to that. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much, Echo. Um, so I'll take the the one on, on protectionism and then Gabrielle, I'll hand it over to you for the question on affordability. And we also have one on how could the report inform the next round of NDCs. Um, so on the afford uh, the uh, protectionist one. So um, when looking at uh, different policies, what we saw on the trade policies is that it's not so cut and dry in many contexts, um, is that many of these policies have a large set of different priorities, including securing uh, supply chains, um, recognizing there's a high concentration of many of these emerging supply chains in a handful of countries, um, and the same for critical minerals. So this theme around this, uh, around securing these supply chains, making sure that these uh, technologies, which are increasingly of strategic importance, are being included in uh, and having minimum capacity of manufacturing domestically. Um, these are all sorts of elements from the security angle, but also from an affordability um, and also a, uh, a balancing of global trade. Um, there is other concerns um, from different markets that there may be uh, sort of unfair terms. And so many of these, as Echo highlighted, 40% of them are classified as countervailing measures or um, sort of Re, uh, rebalancing of trade measures. So I think there's a host of different these things that are not necessarily focused exclusively on bringing uh, manufacturing jobs back to certain countries, while this is, I think, part of their objectives, not the sole one. So when looking at the constellation of the impacts of this, this is something that we did not do in this report. This one's very objective, observational, just saying these are the different trade policies that we've uh, witnessed. Um, this will be explored and the impacts of it a lot more in our forthcoming uh, Ener energy technology perspectives report um, that will be coming in at the end of the month. Um, the last thing just to, uh, to emphasize on this is in parallel, a lot of free trade agreements were also advanced. Um, so really when we're seeing these uh, different sort of anti-dumping countervailing measures on the other half of that coin, as well as a continued advancement of different free trade agreements that many of them include uh, clean technology as Echo highlighted. So um, hopefully that answers that question. Uh, Gabriel, over to you. Thanks, and thanks for uh, raising the topic on affordability. Uh, that's a quite uh, quite important uh, topic for, for the IA, so uh, I'm glad that uh, I'm seeing this question. Um, the IA track since the start, uh, their, the, the short-term uh, affordability measures uh, aiming at supporting households and companies from energy price back subsequent to uh, Russia's, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, this was actually, to give it a bit back of a context, part of the updates of the government energy spending tracker, uh, and now fit into the uh, state energy policy report. 
and uh, with energy price uh, progressively uh, uh, going down, short-term affordability report phased down in 2023 and 2024, reaching its peak at the heart of the crisis in, in 2022. And uh, if we're taking the whole time period of um, government intervention, uh, governments earmarked close to uh, 940 billion US dollar globally, uh, with most of the support uh, nested in, uh, in the EU. Uh, it's important to note, actually, and you can see it in the key graph of, uh, of the report, uh, that affordability was the driving force in government spending allocation in 2022, uh, with lower earmarked spend, spending in clean energy technologies. So that's uh, uh, one of the big um, uh, things that we, we, we could see. Uh, second point, um, these short-term intervention by nature are set to phase out. Uh, but it's still far from being the case of fossil fuel subsidies uh, that surged to an unprecedented level uh, to 1.2 trillion in, uh, in, 20, uh, in 2022, mainly in emerging markets and developing economies, and now reaching back similar progressive level to around uh, 600 uh, billion US dollars. Um, and the IA kept and keeps stressing that uh, most of the support measures and uh, subsidies are not effectively uh, targeted to those in uh, most needs. And uh, just to take uh, one of the uh, key findings that we had in the strategies for affordable and fair clean energy transition report that, uh, that we have published uh, uh, early this year, uh, the poorest 20% of households for fossil fuel subsidies only get 10% of them, which is just a, a really striking number. And for even for the short-term intervention that we were talking about that are eventually mostly uh, uh, holding in uh, advanced economies, only one fifth of the tracked measures explicitly target affected, targeted affected uh, households. So, better design uh, program to best target the one in most uh, in most need are is critical and would also, also allow more leeway to um, promote the deployment of clean energy technologies uh, in a just and orderly manner. And uh, I'll just maybe. Uh, finished with my very long answer there. Um, at COP28, we had 20, uh, 200 sorry, countries agreeing to phase out inefficient um, fossil fuel subsidies. And this is already actually a good step forward uh, that, uh, that the EA is, uh, is acknowledging, but uh, it's, uh, we're now looking towards the national implementation of those. And we will, of course, be uh, uh, closely monitoring those uh, in, the, in the next few months. Um, See for affordability, do, do you want me to take uh, the NDC yes. one? Yep. Okay, sure. Um, for so, just uh, like I said before, the next round of NDC will uh, will be hopefully around the um, early next year, with targets for 2035. And what's critical for um, uh, for the next NDC targets is probably two things. First one, we need to ensure that the mitigation uh, targets is in line with long term pledges, uh, which seems kind of obvious, but uh, it's actually not always the case. And that's where uh, the Climate Pledges Explorer is uh, quite uh, important because it's, it gives this uh, transparency and uh, the data to actually um, uh, visualize this uh, uh, alignment or not. And uh, and uh, the the reports that are, that are like the taking stock from taking actions uh, are also critical uh, as they are providing the guidelines and actual um, metrics at regional levels for uh, for implementing uh, those uh, long-term pledges. The second, the second point that I would like to underline is uh, that the goal that are set in the NDC targets needs to be supported by policy strategies to implement them in full and on time. And uh, the State of Energy Policy Report can serve as a valuable resource to uh, highlight uh, data and policy trends, best practices, an area for improvement that can guide governments as they develop more ambitious uh, and impactful indices. And by dr uh, drawing upon, uh, about, upon sorry, uh, the report's finding, countries can make more informed decisions about which policy to implement and strengthen uh, to meet their climate commitments. Um, the report also emphasized uh, that while prioritizing climate change mitigation, uh, which is essential, policy must also consider a wide variety of uh, our concerns that are uh, energy security, competitiveness, as we've seen uh, with um, uh, domestic manufacturing and, uh, and trade policies, and affordability to ensure a uh, successful and equitable energy transition. Um, hopefully that's answering your questions. Back to you. 
Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so I think the next ones we'll take through, um, we have what could potential reasons be for the higher investments on hydrogen batteries? Um, and what is the influence it could have on uh, battery energy storage technologies and energy storage investments? So I think we'll take send that one over to Echo. I'll read the next question as well. Um, actually, I have to read it off another screen. Echo, if you want to start with that one, <laughs> then we'll, we'll do that. Sure, we we'll do. Um, so on this question, I believe it's more uh, towards the DMI side of the house as well. So um, yes, you're right that uh, what we have noticed and also what's shown on the slide earlier as part of the charts is that uh, hydrogen investments are actually higher than batteries. And uh, one of the reasons that this could, be, uh, this could happen was also because of how um, the market share for global batteries production has pretty much been quite uh, taken up by China. And um, specifically, actually China takes up about 60% of the global batteries production worldwide. Whereas for hydrogen, we believe that it still has a pretty long runway towards the low carbon future. And that said, there is still room for the manufacturing capacity uh, for hydrogen on a global level. Uh, there's still opportunity for countries to continue to size up their production and manufacturing capacity on, in this area. And therefore, we do notice that um, for hydrogen itself, it, does exp it did experience the highest amount of growth since 2020 itself. And uh, with that, this actually stems from some of the larger packages uh, released, particularly looking into the hydrogen area. So that includes, like, for example, the um, Canada's Clean Hydrogen Investment Tax Credit. Um, that's one of the biggest area, in, uh, and definitely we, uh, this is also taken care of by the US IRA Act as well. So uh, more countries are, in fact, pumping in more money to support the hydrogen production. Um, but rest assured, I don't think this will pretty much uh, derail the progression of the energy storage investments. In fact, we still see that the, uh, the, there's still steady increase in the investment that goes into energy storage. And I think that is also stemming uh, behind the whole series of efforts behind grid digitalization, um, the up and coming uh, growth in terms of the EV sectors and etc. Just that what we notice is that there's a bit more concentration in these areas, but that said, many other countries have been encouraging or rather putting in a lot of packages installed uh, that is also up and coming since this year as well, in order to have more more market share in batteries. So this is something that we will still like, uh, we will like to still stay tuned to and to also watch the developments in this space. And I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much, uh, Echo, on that. So um, the next question that we have here is, uh, how might the energy policy landscape change in, uh, with a general shift of priorities towards industrialization and competitiveness, which I think Gabrielle will take? Um, and then, actually, Gabriel, if you want to start with that one, and then we'll, we'll quest from there. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for, for, for the question. Uh, yeah, I'll just uh, underline roughly uh, one, one trend. We, we need to, like, take, if we're taking a step back, we already see a huge change in energy policies over the past, uh, uh, over the past uh, uh, decade. And uh, we didn't really emphasize this in the, in the presentation, but I think we should uh, uh, emphasize it in the, in the Q&A here. Uh, we had two trillion uh, current spending that has been earmarked in in the past four years. Which is, I mean, if we were just uh, talking about this uh, uh, even ten, 10 years ago, I think that's I mean that's a number that we would not uh, have uh, have expected. So there's been a big, uh, already big shift uh, in uh, in energy policies uh, uh, over the past uh, over the past four years in uh, for 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 those in in the context of um, uh, industrialization and competitiveness that you're. That you're uh, that you're mentioning, uh, we we do see uh, uh, already in these four years uh, already um, uh, a big shift in uh, uh, in in government uh, interventions. Like uh, when we were tracking the uh, sustainable uh, uh, recovery packages uh, that were resulting from the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic, um, what we were seeing from these packages was still a focus on. Uh, trying to uh, to foster the uptake and adoption of uh, of clean energy technologies, but more in a uh, consumer consumer perspective. And uh, there's been a clear switch uh, from uh, the the Inflation Reduction Act from the US, uh, with uh, uh, an increasing uh, interest and uh, incentives towards uh, domestic manufacturing. And um, this switch is uh, is quite critical uh, uh, in our uh, in our analysis and uh, and data. 
uh, and um, and uh, we we do expect this to uh, to be kept forward uh, uh, in the in the coming years because all the uh, the the recent announcement that we've been tracking uh, uh, for 2023 and uh, the first quarter the first uh, half of 2024 are actually really focused on on this uh, on this topic so domain smart factoring and uh, trying to uh, to secure uh, clean clean energy transition for uh, for 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 its region. Um, and besides this, I think we, we can, uh, I mean, Eco already uh, uh, flagged, this, uh, flagged this quite, uh, quite well. Uh, we, we see all these um, trade policies that are, uh, that are implemented uh, on, a, uh, uh, on an over level. And uh, maybe I'll just pro probably just cover one topic that is more uh, of my uh, expertise as, a, as an economist, but for um, uh, carbon pricing, we, we see, um, uh, we see an, up, uh, an uptake of uh, uh, new policies and interactions towards uh, uh, towards um, um, uh, towards more uh, uh, rules to to try to decarbonize uh, inside the regions. Some some uh, some industries that would uh, be uh, left to carbon leakages if there were uh, just uh, no. Uh, compensation for for imports. So that's the discussion that has been raising uh, with the the CBAM in the EU. Uh, we know that's a question that is also raised uh, with the UK and uh, over uh, emission trading scheme. And uh, and I think that's a uh, a trend that uh, that uh, that is in the uh, in the discussion for uh, for the past year, and that uh, that will be uh, the the key topic for 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 the next uh, years to come. Uh, I hope that answers the the questions. Perfect. So we have three um, technology specific questions coming up. Um, I think I'll try and tick through them quickly. So the first is just on what is the outlook for uh, heat pump um, uh, technologies, particularly in light of Ukraine's announcement of ending gas transit to Austria via Slo Slovakia and the Renewable Heat Act that is banning gas heating um, start, um, starting in 2040. I believe, and then uh, are there plans to speed up those incentives? So starting with this one here, um, we've tracked around 380 billion of uh, incentives for uh, buildings related uh, energy efficiency. Around 5% of those are exclusively for heat pump incentives, but a lot of those um, are captured as well in broader uh, retrofit incentives as well, which make about 60% of the total uh, government spending made available to these. So um, within that, the largest facility is the the EU's uh, resilience and resilience and recovery facility, um, in which uh, member governments are able to uh, sort of specify what specific elements um, would be going. Uh, in their countries two different aspects of uh, their en energy resilience uh, uh, plans. Um, and so in that, um, we know that some countries like Poland uh, passed new uh, updates this year that make um, some of these incentives available for buildings, retrofits, and heat pumps on this. So we're seeing uh, as these priorities shift, there is flexibility in that facility for countries to be able to move and allocate more to these critical interventions. Um, we do know that this, these funds are available after 2027. So there are some opportunities to both replenish that as well as also shift that funding around in key member governments there. So um, that I think is hopefully answering some of the elements there. Um, then in terms of EVs, we have a question on recent dip in EV sales and the dominance of Chinese automotive manufacturers have made non-Chinese OEMs reconsider their electrification strategy and also second thoughts about delaying full electrification. What impacts could the policies have on the OEMs? So um, as uh, Echo had signaled before um, in her slide, the uh, passenger vehicle incentives are some of the largest single allocations that we've seen. Um, I believe we're at 290 billion in total made available for basically uh, low carbon vehicle manufacturing. This covers all forms of this, um, including uh, some incentives for hybrids and some incentives for uh, alternative vehicles that run on hydrogen, let's say, but the bulk of this is for electrification. And a lot of this is direct manufacturing incentives as well. So um, while we are seeing the impacts of, of the slowdown in sales, um, notably in, in Europe and in the US, um, we are also still seeing the growth globally, um, according to our global electric vehicle outlook and the world energy outlook that will be coming out 
um, shortly that we're seeing that these trends uh, are on a pathway for continued growth. So we see these incentives still being strong enough from a consumer perspective um, and also from an OEM perspective to continue some of that momentum, but the near-term trajectory is, uh, is a bit more uncertain than some of these markets. But I think the important thing to say is in China in particular, where a lot of these incentives are, um, we are continuing to see uh, growth. So I think they are being quite effective in that regard. Um, and then finally, a question on synthetic fuels um, and sort of our forecast and how much we follow those. Um, and so this this product, as I said, is, is purely a data product. We do track incentives for low emissions alternative fuels, uh, both the incentives for those and any regulations for blending. Um, so these obviously influence the outlook for those, but I would encourage you to look to the World Energy Outlook and the Energy Technology Perspectives reports that will be coming out in the future about the impacts for that. So um, thank you for that question. Um, Sorry, I'm looking at the next one now. Um, I think there's a question broadly on uh, coal uh, targets for net zero. Um, and so just talking about what we track there and we do track the progress on some of those commitments. Uh, so maybe Gabrielle, that's something that we can, I'll pass to you and I'll just tech through. I think these will be the last questions that we'll be able to, to handle um, today. Um, thank you for all the questions. Um, why does, in general, government spending support renewable hydrogen um, uh, and electrolyzers while hydrogen production from biomass um, can also potentially have negative emissions? Um, so I'm happy to take that one as well. And then um, I think that's the same question as was asked above. So um, perfect. So I think focusing on the, the coal net zero and the other supporting policies that help with the coal energy transition, Gabrielle, I'll hand that over to you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Dan. Um, for for the question, I think it's it's, it's not uh, it was not finished in the in the, in the clinic, but I'll try to 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 answer it anyway. Um, we we do track uh, uh, any plans um, that are uh, towards uh, the phase out of coal, uh, of unabated coal, actually, uh, in the in the report and in the uh, energy policy inventory. And uh, we do have uh, analysis uh, in the in the report showing that the uh, there is actually an uptake in uh, uh, from governments to uh, to phase out the, the the use of unabated coal uh, in the um, in the power sector. Uh, that's uh, again like to be uh, taken into context of uh, of an increase in um, in, uh, in climate emissions and uh, alignment with their uh, climate uh, neutrality goals. Uh, what we also uh, see in the analysis is that. Um, uh, we see definitely an increase, which is actually uh, uh, mostly because of international commitments with the G7 um, a pledge uh, to uh, to decarbonize electricity by uh, 2035 and um, and uh, and coal phase out in the in the 2030s. Um, uh, but that's just one small part of uh, coal use in the power sector and. Uh, uh, we have uh, we have in uh, in the analysis uh, a nice graph that is actually showing um, some uh, some of uh, uh, the large portion of uh, uh, elevated coal use uh, in the power sector that is just not covered by such commitment, uh, not even uh, uh, a plan or an announcement to uh, to to phase down those. Um, and uh, most of these uh, of these uh, coal. Uh, coal, uh, coal use is actually still covered by by a net zero uh, target. So uh, there is definitely some inconsistencies uh, between uh, those um, lack of uh, lack of commitment in uh, for for the coal and uh, the net uh, zero targets uh, that are that are being held. And uh, the IEA is always uh, uh, ready to uh, to work with countries to to actually uh, set plans and. Um, um, provide uh, milestones to to help um, uh, governments to to set targets for uh, and policies for um, um, decarbonizing their power sector. Perfect. And I'll take the last question, which is on on hydrogen. Um, so. Uh, when we were looking at this, many of the different types of policies that were on the table providing uh, financial support to uh, hydrogen, um, many of these are broad-based and not technology specific. So these would fit in general innovation funds um, and some of these uh, would be sort of in the broader context of RD&D &D support. And I would encourage you to look at uh, a new 
uh, data report and data product that we have out, um, which is about policies uh, in uh, innovation that uh, will, I think, came out in September. It's on page 19 if you want to see the link, link to it in our current report. Um, so this is one that sort of gives a little bit more detail on the types of innovation policies um, and policy support targeting these technologies. That said, of course, there are some that are quite specific um, and are targeting uh, electrolyzers and uh, but a general push and guidance from, from the IEA oftentimes is to make sure that these innovation products are uh, more broad-based and be able to uh, support a wide set of answers and not being technology specific. Um, and that this, as you move across the supply chain of innovation, as you get closer to sort of final products and looking at scaling, that's when maybe you hone in on a few technologies that you know um, are a bit more proven. But um, this is something that is discussed more at length there. Um, and I'd also just point out that our global hydrogen review also came out, I think, last week or two weeks ago. Um, and so this is something to also uh, look into and has a lot more uh, explanation. So um, we got a few more last minute questions that we might be able to take. Um, do, 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 I think we got that one, that one. Um, are you planning to release or allow uh, allow to opt in for weekly, bi-weekly newsletters on the latest updates from the energy policy inventory, government spending tracker? Um, excellent question on the frequency of the updates there. And then the last one as well is to convert abated coal uh, from unabated coal by using very costly CCS technology. Is that viable? Um, or are there any other alternatives, um, including with renew renewables um, and other solutions? So um, happy to... I'll, how do we want to add these? I? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go through these just so we can close on time. Um, so on the second one around uh, abated coal, um, so CCUS technology, um, when you look at to our outlooks, um, yes, right now it's costly, but it's very important to bring this down the cost curve. Um, this is one of the key technologies that we see innovation really necessary because in our net zero tech, uh, roadmap, having carbon capture sequestration and direct air capture will be essential to make sure we are aligned with an IPCC scenario, IPCC scenario um, with low overshoot that's still consistent with 1.5. Um, without this technology, it is not achievable. So I think it's quite important for us to be investing those dollars today for that innovation. Yes, it's expensive today, and the objective would be to bring that down the cost curve because it will be essential for our climate goals uh, in the future. And then on the, the updates, so yes, the IEA does have a weekly newsletter um, that will give these updates. Um, we The exact frequency in which these will be updated um, for these different products uh, is, is something that we're still determining. We know we will be updating these policy report at least once a year um, or the policy database, um, but hopefully we might have some more interim updates as well. The Converse for that will be on the NDC tracking and the net zero tracking product that Gabrielle also spoke about. This, uh, given next year, the big focus on providing updates for NDCs, um, uh, that there will be a lot of updates of NDCs. We will be uh, updating that tracker as close to real time as possible. So once we see a new NDC being published by a country, being able to factor that in and provide the energy specific implications for the CO2 trajectory that it, that new NDC is implied. So look for that data product. It's something that we will be uh, very uh, working very hard to make sure we're keeping the latest update updated available to inform the negotiations and discussions leading up to COP30. So um, with that, Thank you everyone for your time today. Um, thank you to both my colleagues for answering all these questions and the great work on the report. And thank you to the wider team that helped support uh, analytically and building this up. It was really a cross agency effort. Um, and it's something that we as the IA remain committed to tracking progress uh, on policies and giving you the latest information, hopefully in a increasingly digestible manner. So thank you again for your attendance. Um, and uh, is there one other thing? Yep. Thank you, Dan, actually, for 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 uh, leading this uh, this report and uh, and uh, making this presentation happen. I just wanted to um, discuss Elisa's um, uh, message on the the recording. So this uh, this presentation and Q and A was uh, was recorded, and we will make it uh, available on the uh, uh, AA website. So no worries on that. Thank you, and thank you all for attending. <laughs>